Perhaps I treated you too harshly. When I say this game reminded me of playing Obscure 2, that should give those of you who have been around the channel for a while some idea of what is about to happen. Now, in fairness, there are good ideas in this game, and I want to be fair in saying that much of my frustration is down to a mixture of personal preference, bad timing, and a horrendous game-breaking bug all coming together to the point where, when the last thing happened, I simply could not force myself to replay the several hours necessary to fix it. The game had worn me down, real-world events had significantly lowered my tolerance for irritation, and I was already prepared to partially roast the game to begin with because its obsession with mocking fat people borders on the pathologic. However, I want to start with the things that I liked before we crack on. While the first game had a more generic fantasy setting, the sequel made things more distinct. With a northern snowy region of vaguely Nordic seal hunters, an island tropical region where the elves live now, and a Mediterranean-inspired locale for the fantasy Romans invading the rest of the world. In comparison to the first game, your evil tower here is quite literally an inverse of your predecessor as you venture out from a hanging upside-down tower from the netherworld. We even learn that this evil realm is where minions originally came from when the first of their kind clawed to the surface to serve the first overlord. Speaking of the minions, they remain the standout charm of the setting and are now able to mount up on a variety of creatures in order to improve their combat and movement abilities. Browns get wolves that can leap over small gaps and break shield formations, greens get spiders that can climb up walls, reds get salamanders, in massive quotations, that can throw fire while moving and roll themselves along otherwise impassable surfaces, and blues... Well, they were apparently meant to get dolphins, but that was scrapped to let them push you on rafts instead because it isn't like they're good at fighting. They did, however, give extra utility to the blues, such as being able to absorb otherwise debilitating magic ooze in the wastelands, and turning invisible when you manually move them, allowing you to sweep blues through enemies and reach switches without being attacked. They also exaggerated the differences between the minions, giving brown minions furry shawls and loincloths, glowing patches on the underside of the red minions, that kind of thing. What I love about the opening of the game is that it isn't just guiding you, the player. The minions are clearly guiding and testing the witch boy to see if he has what it takes to become the new overlord they've been searching for since our predecessor disappeared in an unfortunate Hellgate incident. The addition of pylons that let you take direct control of the minions provides a new perspective to the game world as you traverse areas you'd otherwise never see yourself. The most noteworthy example of this being an extended stealth mission when you retrieve the green minions from captivity. As for characters, I want to say that I like Kelda and Faye, but those come with such severe asterisks attached that I don't want to get into it here. Instead, let's just dig into this, shall we? We begin our journey with a storybook opening narrated by Null, our advisor from the previous game, explaining that the minions searched far and wide for a new master after the loss of the third overlord, and finally found someone worthwhile on Midwinter's Eve in the snowy town of Nordberg. It's here we meet the much maligned Witch Boy, a yellow-eyed, blue-skinned orphan left outside the town gates as an infant, who is constantly treated with suspicion and malice by its residents, with one notable exception in the form of the red-headed girl Kelda. It's clear she has a little crush on the strange-looking lad, shouting encouragement as he fights a pack of kids who were bullying him because children learn how to act from their parents. Witch Boy! I see you, demon child! Considering there's an entire group of these kids ganging up on the witch boy, it's very rich that they call him a big mean bully for destroying their snowmen to reach them when he is one, shorter than them, and two, all by himself. At least, until the minions join him. Once his new minions have stolen the kids' coats to blend in, the witch boy is able to get past the gate and into the midwinter celebration, where he subsequently launches fireworks at the celebratory tree. This You know what? Good for him. This town sucks. Immediately after, we hear alarm bells as the town comes under attack, prompting the minions to scatter. 
We follow Kelda to the top of the tower walls, where we're greeted by the sight of Wish.com Romans demanding that Nordberg hands over its magic users for cleansing, as magic shenanigans were detected by the Glorious Empire's mysterious sentinels, who are definitely not magic using magic detectors, please ignore their spooky robes and creepy whispering. Without hesitation, one of the adults yeets the witch boy to his certain doom, just throws a whole seven-year-old child to his death. Like I said, this town sucks. With the help of the minions, the witch boy manages to slip the Empire's net, freeing a caged yeti in the process, only to end up falling into a lake and freezing into a cartoon block of ice. Fortunately, the minions find and bring him back to the netherworld, where they convince Null he's the one by recounting this daring escape. They melt the ice and proceed to raise the lad, which I can only imagine in the vein of some kind of Adam's Family shenanigans, because look at these goddamn gremlins. There is no possible way Witch Boy doesn't have some ridiculous and macabre stories to tell his future therapist. In the time it takes him to grow up into a long Dorito-shaped 20-year-old, the empire that attacked Nordberg spreads across the land, conquering, enslaving, and seizing anything and everything magic-related, because magic is bad now, including the living creatures that happen to be magical in nature. This is particularly bad for us, because no matter what the Overlord wiki asserts, the only human thing about Witch Boy is his mother. I mean, look at him. But we'll get into where he comes from later. We return to a now grown-up witch boy as he runs through tests devised by Narl, accompanied by our new jester minion, Quaver. Far less annoying than the previous jester, Quaver is lyrical and amusing, though I'd need an Irish person to verify how accurate his accent is. After bashing our way through some combat tutorials using our old yeti friend as a test dummy, we emerge blinking into the frosty sunlight to club some baby seals. Scattering. Fluffy <laughs> reds! See? Poor fishy! Oh, Dice ready for a ball! The game is wearing its outrageous sense of humor right on its sleeve, which I would be fine with if it had stuck to just stupid slapstick and the like, but we'll get into that, won't we? We chase after the Yeti, who seems to have taken quite a liking to the baby seals, and the game manages to get a genuine snort of laughter out of me for this. This is my Yeti! I saw it first! Get lost! Moving through the hunting grounds, we see leaf banners all over the place with peace symbols on them, signaling our imminent introduction to the elves, since we saw them last in the previous Overlord game. I wonder how they've grown and- What do you think you're doing? Cease this barbaric slaughter at once! I am Florian Greenheart, and these are the soldiers of the Sanctuary! Valiant protectors of the sanctuaries and all creatures of magic and nature! Just stop! Oh, this was a choice. After Baby's first boss fight with the Yeti, it escapes with the elves and we're forced to go further inland as we lack a means to follow them across the sea. We run headfirst into the Empire once again and, and encounter the local governor, Boreas, ordering the retrieval of a spellstone. Better not let it fall into Boreas's pudgy hands! Swiftly moving on through some warm caves, we discover a local elf sanctuary, closely guarded enclaves used to protect them and other magical creatures from imperial persecution. The dryad guarding the way acknowledges Witch Boy as a magical creature, but Florian quickly snitches on our seal clubbing sins and our way is barred. Elsewhere in the cave, we find slain Empire soldiers and the spellstone they were carrying. As soon as we try to make off with it, however, we're accosted by gnomes, depicted here as ankle-high, fuzzy little squeakers in pointy hats. That's clearly an act of aggression, sire! It cannot be tolerated. Exterminate those squeakers! Okay. Arriving outside Nordberg Town proper, another world gate pops up and allows us to return the spellstone, unlocking the evil presence spell. And I just want to say, I don't like the way they did spells here. I much prefer the spells in the previous game because they were simpler to use and more distinct. Anyway, we test the spell on some villagers and learn about destruction and domination, this game's version of the corruption system. If you hold the villagers under the spell briefly, you enslave them, and if you hold them under it for longer, it outright deletes them from the mortal coil. 
While I fully understand this is a game about being an evil overlord, I'm sad to see the low corruption idea replaced by slavery, because both destruction and domination are just brute force applied differently, whereas the low corruption path in the first game didn't necessarily have to be genuine heroism so much as strategic manipulation. Anyways, having mastered this new spell means Witch Boy is accepted as the Netherworld's new master. He is officially the new overlord. We tour the yet-to-be-refurbished tower, containing the main room, the forge, the personal quarters, and the minion caverns. You can upgrade your minions from the forge, and with each upgrade their corresponding location in the caverns is expanded upon, with more little houses and detail, which is neat. There's also an ancient blue minion called Mortis, who can bring back a dead minion if you want to bring back your best equipped ones at the expense of fresh ones. Returning to the surface world, we find our way blocked by flaming barricades that can only be brought down by the Reds. Heading back to the Sanctuary Caverns, the previously dormant Shard of Netherrock has woken up, allowing us to take direct control of a minion and go places that are too small for the Overlord's towering stature. We use this to bypass the Judgmental Dryad at the Sanctuary, hacking and slashing our way in only to be jump-scared by gnarl-voicing tiny fat fairy women with massive bazongas. Kindly to your type here. You just make trouble, throwing fireballs and scaring the wildlife, just like those little red devils. Come on, Petunia, let's leave this riffraff. In combat, they enthrall your minions and lead them away to get snapped up by flytrap creatures, which is a bit of a problem, I would say. Blocked by two dryads instead of one, we venture elsewhere in the sanctuary to find our red minions, who are very good at burning plants, plant people, and sucking up anything fire-related. Florian is of course none too pleased with the Overlord's intrusion, not that he can do much to actually stop us, and we take an elevator down to where the elves are hanging out. Ooh, that fay's a nice-looking wench. It is she's a fairy. No! God, please, no! No! Fighting our way through more dryads, we destroy a statue of Faye and steal a spellstone, which she is none too amused by. I'm thankful they didn't just give her an airy valley girl voice, because based on all of the everything the devs did with Florian, I was afraid. You have stolen our spellstone, intruder, and defiled this shrine, bringing darkness into a place of light. Suffering be upon you. Returning the Red Hive to the Netherworld, we come back to Nordberg, kick Imperial ass, and blast our way through the town gates, prompting a visit from Marius, who just appears very suddenly from a flash of blue light, a suspiciously magical-looking form of transportation for the supposedly magicating Empire, but don't worry about it, stop asking questions. Marius is the brother of Boreas, and he informs us that Emperor Solarius isn't happy that the Overlord has invaded Nordberg, which, odd that the Emperor isn't even aware of that. Wonder why that would be. You were sent here to prove yourself as a governor. And show you've got a backbone beneath that blubber. He hasn't. It's blubber all the way through. Groundbreaking. There's a brief moment of connection here as the red-headed woman accompanying them looks up to stare at the Overlord, and Narl has to yell at him to snap out of it, so this is now a Kelda witch-boy truther household, there are no other mistresses. We bring down the pillars holding up a statue of Boreas and use it to open a path forward, bringing us to a direct confrontation with the man in question, and by direct confrontation I mean dropping another statue directly on his head. Marius is furious and bamps out of there, leaving us to deal with Boreas, who is shockingly still alive, and despite very clearly seeing his twitching body with his head pinned under the statue, it's now pinning him across his torso, even though the weight of it should have crushed him, but whatever. Here, slave! Get me out at once! No way! Even your crevices have crevices! Yuck! He's an imperial colonizing coward, and the best thing you can think to insult is his... No. No. We'll get to that in the section after I cover the plot. We'll get there. I choose Domination, which reduces Boreas to sucking his thumb in the fetal position, and swiftly exit the area with Kelda in tow as our first mistress. We will also talk about this later, because if I do it now, we will get severely sidetracked. You can't really buy anything for the quarters yet aside from Kelda's banners, which sadly does not change the wrap around your shoulders like it did in the previous game. Moving on, a man from Nordberg requests an audience in which he warns the Overlord about a group of villagers planning to steal food and sail away from Nordhaven in one of their ships. He also asks the Overlord if he would lend him Kelda, 
because the nights get very cold and lonely in Nordberg, and the worst Narl calls him is a cheeky devil. Which, in this context, I'm not sure if he means that as an insult or a compliment. Oh! Ew! Ew! What the fu- We deal with the rebel villagers by convincing them to help us break one of the ships out of the ice with fireworks, because the alternative is setting fire to all the tar pits in the area to melt the surrounding ice, including a massive one that will probably burn as long as the coal seams under Centralia, and that would upset the elves because the game has a bone to pick with 1970s counterculture, I guess. Hey look, it's the man! The man's gonna bring us all down! After a spot of baby seal slaughter by chasing them into some sea mines, we finally sail into the open ocean and head for Everlight, the ancient island retreat of the elves. We arrive at the Outer Reefs to find that all the melting ice up in Nordberg caused a massive wave to crash through and interrupt the Empire's invasion of the area, so point one for climate change? In the confusion, the gate to Everlight was left open, but as soon as we approach, the elves promptly remove the four keystones used to activate it, and we have to sail around to put them back in place. The first two keys are fairly simple, but the third is almost taken away by a ship, requiring us to burn its sails in a chase sequence and commandeer it. With the third in place, we head back to our ship and... Look at all those fat, fishy females! Oh, for two tons of chips and a bucket of vinegar! The joke is that the mermaids are fat. Did you catch that? Did you understand the entire joke is that they're fat? Did you get it? They're fat. Please laugh. It's funny that they're fat. <coughs> Placing the fourth key is simple enough once we fight our way through more elves, allowing us to finally sail through the open gate to Everlight proper, only for us to crash against the rocks due to spiders and... other... distractions. Once ashore, we set about releasing our crew from spider cocoons scattered throughout the jungle of Everlight, and not to be a total f nerd, but this environment is called a jungle. It's clearly meant to be some tropical island paradise the Empire is using like Fantasy Ibiza, and yet it has both pandas and Rafflesia arnaldi, corpse flowers, those big red things all over the place, also known as giant padma. Pandas do not live in jungles, and Rafflesia arnaldi only grows in the rainforests of western Sumatra by parasitizing an already parasitic climber that only targets a specific kind of tree. Whilst rainforest has an actual ecological meaning, jungle isn't so solidly defined, but the main difference between the two is that a rainforest has a continuous canopy layer that deprives the undergrowth of sunlight, leaving it damp and dark but with a traversable forest floor. Jungle, by comparison, usually refers to a similar climate as rainforest but lacks the canopy layer, which means sunlight reaches the forest floor, leaving it warm and humid, with thick vegetation making the forest floor almost impassable. Now, did this fantasy pantomime game about being an evil overlord with a rat army need to get its ecology right? Not really, but I'd be so much more forgiving had the game not irritated the shit out of me. Anyway... These females are the height of elven beauty. They force-feed themselves to look like their mother goddess deity. Hell of a wobble these ladies have. Ooh, hell of a wobble! Conscious decisions were made to do this, and at a certain point it stops being low-effort, edgy humor and starts looking like a morbid cringe obsession. We eventually reach a point where we have to proceed alone, and after narrowly avoiding getting our limbs chewed off by a panda, we run into the green minions, who seem to have a very strange friend. The figure is dressed like the magic-detecting sentinels that help the Empire track down anything magical for collection, but they disappear without attacking us. Odd. Tracking the green hive to a secure Empire facility, we spot the same woman from earlier being hauled by the arms like a prisoner. How unfortunate. This is where the extended stealth mission happens, and depending on your taste for such things, this is either the best or worst part of the game. Controlling a pack of green minions, we sneak around the facility to take out all the sentinels in the area and get the green hive to safety, but during all this, we're treated to a cutscene regarding the distressed Empire woman. Apparently, this lady is the only skinny one in the Empire, so all the fat women's husbands are after her, and I am so tired. They weren't bewitched. They were bored. I can't help it if rich and powerful men are attracted to me. She's a witch! She must be! Eventually, we get the green hive out of there, allowing us to freely summon and upgrade the greens. 
I'm going to start speeding through this as best I can, because if I don't, we'll get bogged down. From here, we fight a giant spider and get spider mounts for the greens, allowing them to climb surfaces and reach things we otherwise can't. Heading into Everlight Town, we smash our way through the Imperial tourists, enslave the governess, and acquire Juno, the imperiled Imperial Lady, as our second mistress. I see you've already arranged a peasant slave as my lady-in-waiting. She's a bit scrappy. The only thing I'm waiting for, Empire, is for you to put a foot out of line so I can hang your carcass up on the wall with the other pretty bacon things. We. We're warned by another Nordbergian grass about an elf commune trying to lure our followers away, so we head over and enslave them all. Back at the tower, the mysterious figure from earlier makes an appearance and warns Witchboy about making the same mistakes as his predecessor and seems to know an awful lot about the Overlord before us. I wonder why a female character in this setting would know intricate details about an overlord's pattern of behavior. Anyway, she remarks that she's been watching him for many years and tells him to learn what future awaits him by going to the old lands where the third overlord's tower used to be. Now, I genuinely found coming back to the old lands and seeing how messed up it all was very interesting, as it soon discovered that the cause of the cataclysm and the magical plague that caused the rise of anti-magic sentiments was the old tower heart exploding though we won't learn what exactly caused it to explode until near the end of the game. Narl also confirms that Witchboy is the son of the Third Overlord, remarking that the Dark Tower is where his evil seed was planted, and that his mother didn't feel it was a good place to raise a child, so she left before he was born. Boy, I wonder who the mysterious woman who's been watching us for years is. Unfortunately, we can't get far without the blue minions because of the dangerous magic ooze everywhere. Juno points us in the direction of the Empire, seeing as the Discount Romans stole the blue minions for their arena, where all magical creatures go to the slaughter. We hack and slash our way through, commandeering a catapult, killing a brute enemy, and stealing a sedan chair to get inside the city. Once inside, the minions careen into the slums, and we smash through a bunch of shacks until we reach the arena dungeons, where soldiers are inviting the Empire's most desperate and destitute to watch the games for free, and clearly use them as cannon fodder. Entering the arena dungeons, we puzzle our way through some tedious bull to free the blue ones from their various cages and get ourselves captured by running face first into Emperor Solarius while he's having his daily spa treatment of absorbing magic from all the magic shit his empire has seized. Thrown into the arena, we fight through waves of enemies until our old friend the Yeti is brought out, whereupon we bait him into breaking down some doors that allow us to collapse the balcony Solarius and Marius are standing on. They manage to escape and we subdue the Yeti, finally bringing the blue hive home with us. Now that the blue minions are with us, we're able to fully explore the wastelands, which results in another encounter with the elf queen Fae. Given that neither of us wants to be wiped out by the Empire, she's willing to work with us and has Florian guide us to the remaining shards of the Tower Heart. Unfortunately, this does involve Florian getting ambushed and captured by the Empire, but since there's nothing we can really do about that, we return to Fae. She sends us below the final sanctuary, where we can use four shrines to charge the Dormant Heart, which will unfortunately kill everything depending on those shrines, but these are desperate measures for desperate times. Fighting through various wildlife, elves who don't agree with Fae's decision, and a very annoying giant lizard, we return the heart to Fae just as the Empire is breaking through, is what I would say had the game not completely wet itself at this point and broken. I had the Tower Heart with me, only I made the mistake of teleporting while within the sanctuary and the game decided to just eat the tower heart. I scoured that place and couldn't find it anywhere. I tried to go up the lift, it would not activate. I tried to enter from above, the stairs were broken now, and I had no save that wasn't hours back. But the shrines haven't done enough to awaken the heart. Seeing no other option, Faye allows herself to be drained, so the heart has enough power to push back the Empire. And it's here things get deeply uncomfortable. If you drain her enough to power the heart, it taints her energy and turns her evil, causing her to do a complete 180 in personality and want to jump your bones as your third mistress. If you completely drain and kill her, she becomes a banshee for all intents and purposes and also wants to jump your bones as your third mistress. All the while, her followers keep trying to save her from you, asking her why she's letting that nasty man do this to her and telling the overlord that she's too pure for him as it becomes increasingly obvious that your efforts are corrupting her. <laughs> We 
we will come back to this later. Once we return to the tower, your various trophies joust for the honor of being your first mistress by promising the corresponding mounts of the browns, greens, or reds for your final battle against the Empire, because what's most important about a woman is what she can do for you, obviously, and for some reason all three of these women are so enamored by your special sword that they will fight amongst themselves for it. I hate it here. Whatever choice we make, there's an elf rebellion to put down in Everlight before we can move on to attacking the Empire. We start by launching the fully powered Tower Heart as the anti-magic shield that keeps the city safe, destroying it and the gates, but somehow not causing the same cataclysm that resulted in the wastelands, don't worry about it. Fighting our way into the heart of the city, we find Emperor Solarius cowering behind a personal anti-magic shield and set about tearing it down, destroying the shrines powering it and recovering what remains of the Tower Heart's energy so it doesn't fall into the Empire's hands. It's halfway through this slog that we're approached by the mysterious woman from earlier who reveals herself to be Rose, the mistress of the Third Overlord and Witchboy's mother. She's also apparently married to Solarius, if Narl's Mrs. comment is anything to go by, and explains that she believed the Empire could bring order and discipline to the land after our father vanished. It's important to remember that Rose wasn't so much the good sister as she was the order to Velvet's chaos, which I guess ties into the domination destruction system of this game, but still. Upon reaching the plaza, where Marius and the Emperor are overlooking a crowd of their own citizens, Marius encourages them to drink from tainted water, turning them all into mindless cannon fodder for us to carve through. We finally get inside the Emperor's palace, only to run into Florian, who has escaped the arena dungeons with the help of a fairy. He vows to deal with Solarius himself with inspirational monologues while we do the smashing. He then proceeds to tell us that the story could have been different if he had magic, as his kind are meant to be magical, yet he couldn't even make a weed grow, and all the other magical creatures mocked him for it. Florian further reveals that he'd hoped the Tower Heart would unleash his potential when he tried to steal it years ago, causing the explosion and the magical plague that made everyone afraid of magic in the first place. Then he starts talking about how the Glorious Empire came to be, and Solarius rose the tide of hatred, and humans are like big dumb animals that are easily controlled, and Florian is Solarius, is what we're getting at here. That's why we've never heard the Emperor speak, and it's always been Marius talking for him, because we can hear Florian's limp wrist from ten miles away. Without the likes of you trying to expunge us! Anyway, he jumps in the vat of magical goo, his empire is consolidated in the hopes of becoming a god, completing his journey of self-pitying violence as a shambling mass of pulsations flesh and misery. What a shame. He rewards Marius for his service by eating him and we slay the monstrosity, ending the game having enslaved everyone or destroyed it all. So, the world building is a mess, but the game hardly takes itself seriously, so I can't be bothered to get too worked up about it. Let's tackle something else. Much like the last game, you have a mistress, but this time you can have three of them without having to pick one over the other. And if you play your cards right, you can have all three of them at the same time, because harem fantasy, I guess. You can also denote one to be your first mistress, which is something the three of them jostle over, because how else are they meant to validate their existence if not through the honor of your attention? If you want to change who your first mistress is, you need to wander off to this tiny room separated from the private quarters, clustered like trophies on a shelf waiting to be picked up and shown off. When you first acquire Kelda, Narl offers this advice. Take my advice on the fairer sex. It's best to keep them happy. I suggest using some of that gold of yours to buy her a few delightful knickknacks for the private quarters. Ladies like knickknacks. Besides, sire, no one needs to come home from a hard day smiting things to an angry mistress. <laughs> this is meant to be funny, but the joke is women are capricious, easily angered creatures who can be distracted by shiny things, and that while having a mistress is very much desired, keeping her happy is viewed as a chore or a preventative measure. Completely ignoring that Kelda makes multiple mentions of her hunting trophies, wrestling wild animals, and other feats of outdoor survival and physical capability, which is really only used to distinguish her from Big Booba Pretty Girl Juno and the otherworldly frail beauty of Faye. She's not like other girls, even though she is still conventionally attractive. It's also worth noting that if you approach Kelda in the private quarters, she can bring up a desire to go out and fight on the battlefield alongside you, but Narl is too protective and won't let her. And I'm supposed to believe that a woman who can wrestle an adult seal and win would actually listen? Okay. 
Next, we have Juno, whom you rescue from being sent to die in the arena for her crimes. Those crimes being practicing witchcraft, and by that I mean seducing the rich husbands of all the fat women who want her dead, because she's apparently the only thin woman in the Empire who isn't living in the slums. She's used to the finer things in life and being pampered, so of course her and Kelda immediately start getting catty because women, am I right? She's also the mistress that Nal is most taken with and makes the most comments about, including this particular line. Ah. Mistress Juno, I just want to stuff her and suspend her in oil and just look at her. Bitch, what the fuck? Finally, we have Faye. I like Faye, initially. She's an antagonistic force who stands firm against you for most of the game, but is shown to be pragmatic when it comes to dealing with the greater threat, the magic-hating empire, and works with you to ensure the survival of her people and the future of magic. Now, they could have stopped here and that would have been fine, great even. It would have balanced out the presence of Kelda and Juno depicting women as pretty trophies or... Hell of a wobble! Instead, as I explained earlier, she sacrifices herself to make sure we can win against the Empire, which involves draining her magic to awaken the Tower Heart. This results in her turning evil either way as your energy corrupts her, which also happens to make her want to f*** you even if you overdo it and kill her, binding her to you as a ghost. So on one hand, you get a brainwashed woman as a mistress, but on the other hand, you murder that woman, rip her bodily autonomy away, and keep her for the same purpose, but now she can't escape even if she had the capacity to want that. What the f there is only one other woman of note in this game, and the only reason she doesn't also end up your mistress is because she's your mother. Small mercies, I guess. Now, in the first game, you got the sex scene with your chosen mistress by either reaffirming your commitment to Rose or validating Velvet's existence by choosing her over her orderly sister. In this game, you do it by just buying all of that mistress's associated furniture. Input money, get pussy. If you do this for all of them, it can result in a scene where the women agree to get along for a bit so the three of them can have you at the same time. And at this point, I'm going to have an aneurysm because even outside the mistresses, there's this gross fixation with the desirability and mocking those who fall outside what the creators consider attractive, hence why you find Nordberg women who were taken as slaves later in the game, now obese with warts and unflattering facial features, saying things like this. Oh, I hope they let me serve at the Emperor's party. I'm pretty enough. Oh, I wouldn't mind being your slave. Which neatly brings us to the other half of Overlord 2's writing issues. I was 15 hours into the game when it hit me with yet another fat joke and I decided that I was just going to cheese my way through the rest of the game to get the process over with faster. At least that was the plan until the game just straight up broke itself. I genuinely cannot understand this game's fixation with mocking fat people as anything other than either a morbid cringe obsession or someone's wife left them for a fat person and now it's our problem. A few times is playground level bullying, more than a few is mean spirited, and the at minimum 20 times this game goes out of its way to express disgust and contempt for fat bodies feels outright malicious. Just what is your damage? Who hurt you? There's nothing I can really even add to this point because it stops just short of a character looking directly at the camera and explicitly saying, fat people are fucking gross, in it, lads? From the list of things that will turn me off a particular story, it feeling mean-spirited is pretty high up there. Not because I think the writing is necessarily bad, but because that feeling of mean-spiritedness can reflect a very cynical attitude from the writer that I simply do not vibe with. In Overlord 2, I think the fixation on making fun of fat people actively dragged the writing down because they just kept going back to it as a crutch, and one made of spun glass at that. I want to believe this kind of humor was relied upon to just save effort and time elsewhere. Game development can be messy, hectic, and full of jury-rigged fixes hidden behind walls someone will clip through from sheer dumb luck. It's like embroidery, you're not supposed to see the other side of the pattern. But considering the rest of the game, this doesn't feel like the case. It feels like the team just decided to target fat people and went to town, which is lazy and mean regardless of how you personally feel about health or attractiveness. Just don't be cruel to people. That's it! Jesus!
obviously do away with the constant side swipes at fat people. Just unnecessary. Change the designs of Imperial characters or change the dialogue so their fatness is at least incidental rather than the thing that is specifically bad about them. And yes, I know someone is going to pop up being, well, they're fat to show the decadence of the Empire. Okay, but even in the actual Roman times, when the Empire was actually a real thing in history, being overweight was not like a common accepted thing to be. It wasn't like approved of. It was seen as a lack of self-control. So like, I just, it wasn't commonplace, even among like the ruling class. Anyway, moving on, the seductive fairies from earlier could have been designed after Impatiens Bequerti, or the dancing girl flower. Strange and fae-like, but charming all the same. As for the sirens, they look like beautiful women from the shoulders up, but once prey is close and they're out of the water, they look like Satan's paralysis demon if he was from the deep ocean. All spines, webbing, and horrifying jaws. I'm picturing a scene where a brown minion notices a pretty lady staring from the water and gets close enough that she can grab him with the jaws that run the length of her humanoid upper half, because that's just a lure when they're shut. Next, instead of Faye becoming your third mistress, you create a future problem for yourself no matter what you do. Option one, you drain her to awaken the Tower Heart, which affects her just enough to corrupt her and withdraw to spread that corruption to the rest of her people, laying some groundwork for a prospective third game where she is the main villain. Option two, you drain her enough to not only power the Tower Heart, but kill her. Instead of quietly slinking away to scheme, Faye is turned into a vengeful banshee and outright declares that she will destroy everything you have, killing those under her protection to raise a spectral army that forces you to flee. This again would lay groundwork for a prospective third game, it just changes the flavor of things. Why doesn't she become your third mistress? Because she's the only noteworthy female character in this game that up until the last sanctuary was staunchly against you and corrupting her to become your f buddy feels gross, personally. In that vein, I'd get rid of Juno as the second mistress too because her whole arc and existence is just a collection of sexist stereotypes with a couple of tits slapped on. We keep Kelda as the first and only mistress, drawing out her interactions with Witchboy to create some form of through line from a childhood crush to an evil conquering battle couple. Yes, I'd want to follow up on the line about joining you in the battlefield and actually have that happen at certain points, say, when you're trapped in the arena, she could swoop in to help. Maybe the Witchboy is hurt in the escape and after Kelda helps save him, this is one of the only times he speaks because he finds it difficult to do so, but he thanks her for always being on his side even when he had nothing and no one. This is what leads to the sex scene rather than buying all of her items like she's a vending machine. Next, we change the elves from limp-wristed 1970s hippie stereotypes who love all things fluffy and make lentil cookies for some reason, and make them ferocious defenders of what little peace they have since escaping near extinction from the dwarves. They could still be nature warriors. But nature isn't all bunnies and butterflies, it's also brain-controlling fungus, flesh-eating bacteria, and chimpanzees, the most violently unhinged primates that even if you survive being attacked by will make you wish you hadn't, because they have a nasty habit of going after the face, fingers, and genitals. Nature has no morals, no right or wrong, no good or bad, the only rule of nature is survival, whether that's by picking off a newborn gazelle for easy calories, or reverse baptizing a prospective mate's offspring so you can make your own. I detest when people make a nature-focused group and decide to just make a flower child joke out of it. Florian's whole deal of resenting his status as an elf who can't elf, so he decides to make everyone pay by creating an empire that reviles magic and magic creatures is perfectly fine to me, but again, I just wouldn't write him with that voice because it's obnoxious and stinks of ye olde homophobia. I don't really have any suggestions for what I would do with the irreverent tone of the game. Humor is very subjective and what I find funny can swing wildly from basic slapstick to watching a supercut of two drag queens roasting each other. You absolutely have the right to find mocking fat people funny, but I also have the right to assume that you were either a bully in middle school or you're a bully now and you've never grown past the stage where picking on someone for their looks was the most intelligent insult you could conjure. All that being said, thank you for sticking with it to the end. I appreciate each and every one of you that watches my videos, comments, leaves a like. It all helps let the algorithm know that my content is something worth showing to a wider and wider audience. For now, I'm going to chill for a few days before I begin working on Prototype 2 as per the last channel poll. It can only go up from here. Special shoutouts to my supporters over on Patreon who are all very handsome people. And if you'd like to support this kind of content, check out the link in the description. Don't forget to drink your water, take your meds, touch some grass, and I will see you all next time.